Hello, everyone. We will start in, in a few minutes, in one minute, actually. So um, let's make sure that everyone is joining. It's still, there are still people coming. So I just want to wait one more minute before start. I hope you can see my screen and you can hear me clearly. Perfect. So uh, in the chat window, in the meantime, maybe you can share which city you are coming from. I Again, today we are um, still quite crowded. And we would like to make sure um, if we are reaching to different regions, maybe it is morning now or night. So um, it would be great if you can share from which city you are joining. Great. Uh, Yale University, Minsk, Strasbourg, Portland, Glasgow, Arizona, New York, Antalya, Oberhausen, Lexington, Seattle, Lille, Bucharest, Sevilla. Great. So it's again, it's again uh, all different parts of the world. Toronto, Hyderabad. Paris, Krefeld, Utrecht. So yeah, again, we have a very diverse audience from different regions. So that's great that we have the chance to um, spread our voice and uh, open lectures to these regions. I hope it will be helpful for you, this, this uh, open lecture. And I would like to start very quickly, a uh, very, very short introduction, just to make sure why we are doing this and who we are. And then afterwards, our uh, guests today is uh, Radomir and uh, Ruben. Who, uh, we will also give them the chance to start the presentation. So uh, thank you everyone again for joining from these different countries and cities. Uh, who am I? I'm Farhan Oskan from XR Bootcamp. Uh, I'm the co-founder of XR Bootcamp. And as XR Bootcamp, our goal is to close the XR skills gap and help you as a creator on bringing the top skills you need for your next job, for your next project, for your next uh, career path. So. In order to achieve that, we are creating these open lectures. I think as far as I remember, it is over 10 now. So um, every open lecture is reaching to hundreds of people. So uh, we are happy to, to continue that. And for those who haven't seen that we have actually uh, some kind of like a, um, a campaign that we are asking you on Twitter, uh, which, which uh, kind of subject or uh, XR expert you would like to see for the next open lecture. So our team will share the link of this tweet. So happy to take your uh, suggestion there. Uh, for us, it is important to listen to the audience and to the community. Um, and without further ado, maybe I can also share that we have also a Discord channel. You can also see that on the chat uh the discord channel uh link and you can join our discord server for these discussions we are having a lot of sharings uh, of learning resources there and uh, you will be also informed of every event of xr bootcamp or any kind of webinar or learning resource that we are sharing there so uh yeah after a little bit of short intro what we are doing right so beginner to advanced level xr courses from ar to vr from beginner like if you are only looking for foundations we have beginner level courses and we have also advanced courses as well on vr ar development 
yeah, these are our um, um, a little bit maybe a feedback on our alumni from great companies, great individuals. So you can actually attend to these classes from anywhere. Uh, even though you are maybe having a full-time job, you can still uh, follow the classes. So uh, we are really focusing on helping students who have uh, maybe a lot of studies or professionals who have a full-time job uh, and they can still follow the class uh, with their own pace or with the live class as well. So um, yeah, we have various classes as I mentioned. Uh, today, I will not go so much into the bootcamp and beginner classes. You can always reach us for these details, but since uh, our open lectures is a little bit for existing um, developers who already start working. We want to a little bit focus on the advanced classes today and optimization is one of them uh, that we are starting pretty soon. Uh, so what we are trying to achieve with the advanced classes, especially if you are a VR or AR developer and would like to uh, create a um, high performance um, and high fidelity VR, AR game or app or enterprise experience. We are, we are creating classes, advanced classes accordingly. So you can achieve these lifelike interactions, performance code and high quality visuals. Uh, these are our upcoming, uh, especially on the advanced part classes. Uh, advanced VR interactions, rendering optimization, dots, and shaders class. So uh, the advanced interaction class, it's actually happening right now. We, have, we are in the third cohort with uh, great participants from different companies and uh, uh, professionals. And this is the overview of our class. We can, I don't want to go so much into detail, but you can always follow our um, website and uh, our YouTube channel to see uh, the highlights of this class. And we are happy to provide more information uh, for the further, further inquiries. But the main um, mindset here is to prepare you to create lifelike interactions, especially for a virtual reality environment with all these hand, hand physics and immersed kinematics, hand gestures, holographic UI, and teleportation. Yeah, th this is our next class. This class will start on March. So um, we are teaching all the relevant techniques you need to optimize your VR app or your mobile game or your PC uh, uh, platform. There's a small twist at the end, which is a nightmare scenario, we call it. So based on the techniques that you have learned, you are implementing these techniques to bring five frames per second, very nice, good looking scene to uh, a level of at least 72 frames per second. So um, this class will start in two weeks. So happy to see you there. Uh, more details uh, you can always reach on Discord and other parts. Um, Maybe um, we can talk about this later, but just to give you an idea of uh, what kind of um, uh, modules are uh, expected on this class. I just don't want to get, go so much into detail, but uh, Ruben, uh, uh, namely the game dev guru, uh, who is the creator of this class is with us today. Maybe uh, throughout the open lecture, if there's a specific question, focusing on this optimization techniques, maybe we can also um, ask him to give more details about that. And also from the game dev guru, uh, we have this optimization checklist, free optimization checklist. We also will share the link of this uh, checklist. So please, if you haven't get uh, you, it is great because it is, uh, it is actually prepared for your VR and AR needs as well. Especially if you are a Unity developer, it is something that might be helpful for you. Uh, we are already sharing this on Discord, but uh, I just want to remind here as well. And yeah, today, as we always do on the webinars, we are um, having a discount uh, for a short duration. So if you are interested on any of these master classes, 
please feel free to reach us anytime and uh, we are happy to discuss further. So now it is time to start the open lecture. Um, I would like to invite Radomir to the stage. Hey Radomir, can you hear me? I think he's preparing right now. So yeah, perfect. Hello, can you hear hey. me now? Hi Radomir, how are you? All right, I'm great, how are you doing? Good, good. So um, Radomir and uh, his team at Incubo is specialized, especially bringing uh, very well-known titles, PC titles to Quest and to VR. And they have already an uh, amazing experience with two titles. They are preparing for the third one. So I would love to listen to Radomir and their experience, their team's experience. And for the uh, technical questions also, as far as I know, in your office right now, there are also other team members. So we are happy to get any question um, uh, coming from the audience. One small reminder before handing over to you, Radomir. Um, if you have any question that you would like to submit throughout the presentation, please use Q&A button because uh, from the chat window, since it is uh, flowing very quickly, it is hard to uh, follow for us. So please uh, use the Q&A button. What button again? Oh, Q&A, okay. And right. submit your question that even the presenter okay. is there. So, um, so uh, Radomir, you can also look at the questions there uh, coming from the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, people will, will uh, share there, so uh, it will be easier for everyone. Then, Thank you, Radomir, for joining us today. We are really curious about what you will share with us today. Maybe there are many game developers here who would like to start their first quest title on App Lab, SideQuest, or Store. So uh, your best practices would be great for us. Stage is yours. All right, thank you very much. Uh, um, I prepared a short uh, presentation, so let me uh, fire, the, fire it up. Um. Perfect. You can maybe say exactly present mode. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, a second. All right. So uh, let me introduce myself first. My name is Radomir Kucharski. I'm working in game development industry for uh, over 20 years now. Um, and uh, my experience spawns through pretty much almost all uh, development roles. Uh, I was working as an artist, uh, then uh, as designer, later as uh, product manager, uh, production manager, and uh, I also owned uh, a couple of game studios. Uh, I started a bunch of game studios and uh, recently I am uh, vice president of production in, uh, in Kuvo. Uh, I used to work on, on, uh, on many uh, high-profile projects, games, for example, Medal of Honor, Allied Assault. Uh, I also worked, uh, recently I'm, I'm focused on uh, uh, VR projects uh, and augmented reality projects, and, uh, and I was working on uh, a couple uh, high-profile or high-profile IPs games. Like for example, uh, I work on uh, Hot Wheels franchise for Mattel. Uh, we work uh, in uh, uh, we work on a couple of uh, of projects for any networks history channel. For example, um, Nightfall based on uh, uh, Nightfall TV series. Uh, and finally, uh, at Incuvo, I was working on. Uh, on Blair Witch project for VR, which was based on Lionsgate uh, uh, movie. Since I'm more of a producer recently uh, and not really hands-on developer anymore, I've got two uh, very experienced developers with me. The first one is Piotr Binkowski, who is uh, an incredibly experienced Unity and Unreal engineer. 
And I also got uh, I also got uh, Tomasz Libisz, who is a similarly experienced Unity and Unreal artist with great technical background. And so they will be helping me on the on the technical questions if uh, any of those appear today. Uh, also, I'd like to say that uh, it was pretty hectic recently in our studio, and there was very little time to prepare myself for that uh, open lecture. So uh, please excuse us if uh, if uh, uh, if something is not up to like higher standards uh, in terms of presentation. Uh, right. So let me also introduce in Kubo essay. Um, in Kubo, uh, used to be a mobile game developer studio, but recently focused uh, itself on uh, VR projects. Um, in Kubo, made two uh, high-profile games recently for uh, various uh, VR platforms, including Oculus Quest. Those are Layers of Fear and Blair Witch Project. Mm. Those are pretty much direct ports of uh, PC and consoles games and both were significantly challenging to port from PC to, uh, to Oculus Quest. And why is that? Uh, because Oculus Quest is almost literally uh, a mobile phone closed in a uh, in plastic case uh, with a strap and two lenses. So uh, it's a very limited platform. It's 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 uh, uh, performance-wise, it's similar to Samsung S20, uh, but uh, in VR, what uh, what we need to do in VR is we need to render two pictures at once, and those need to be rendered rendered and uh, at uh, steady 72 frames per second. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, because. Uh, uh, this is a requirement from from uh, Oculus uh, to keep uh, the experience comfortable. So at this point, it should be pretty obvious that uh, porting a PC game to Oculus Quest uh, is a very difficult task, and it needs a lot of work, and it needs uh, uh, smart development and uh, and some optimization techniques. And I would like to share that experience we got in those two projects uh, with you right now. So maybe I'll start to, to, to say about Layers of Fear. Uh, this game, uh, the core concept for the game is, uh, is created around an artist who is losing his mind and, uh, and is living in a haunted house. And that involved uh, dynamically changing looks and even layout of the house. So uh, since at the beginning or, or on the surface, it looks like it's a very simple project to, to port to Quest because it's mostly indoors and it's, uh, it's close quarters, it's just a house. So it's not like that because um, the, the whole house is, uh, is dynamically changing. It's, uh, it, it, it's uh, even if you, sometimes you can enter uh, the same doors a couple of times and you end up in a different room and uh, and all that uh, all the geometry is moving around it's, it's basically shifting around so uh, we had to do a lot of uh, dynamic lighting and we couldn't we couldn't use some of the of the basic tech the techniques which are pretty obvious for for optimization for oculus quest The second, uh, the second game which we made for Oculus Quest uh, was even more demanding because of even more challenging. Uh, actually, it was it was a nightmare to, to port it to, to Oculus Quest because firstly, uh, it's a kind of open world uh, woods game, and uh, if rendering dense woods with hundreds of trees, grass, and lush foliage is not terrible enough for a mobile platform like Oculus Quest. There is dynamic lighting and uh, and daytime. So basically, the weather was changing during the gameplay, and we started and the daytime too. So uh, in in some levels, we started uh, 
like late evening, and then it cycled through through night. So again, we had hard time. Uh, we we uh, we have to use some kind of uh, dynamic lighting, which, uh, as pretty much all of us know, at this point is a very no no in 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 development for Oculus Quest. Uh, bringing Blair Witch to Oculus Quest needed smart redesign of the levels and serious art optimizations. Uh, that's why we are really happy that we managed to deliver the game on time and uh, on budget. And, uh, and we believe that it, if we could bring uh, Blair Witch to Oculus Quest, that we pretty much can deliver or bring any game to, to that platform. Um, also, uh, Another project we are working on right now, because uh, both Layers of Fear and, and uh, Blair Witch uh, are, are already released. So right now we are working on Green Hell, and this is uh, an open world survival game uh, taking place in uh, Amazon jungle. Um, so this is even, that, that's even worse. Uh, I mean, uh, like when you're making a, a Oculus Quest game, which, as I said, is, is a mobile platform. Uh, what you want to avoid is a lot of uh, transparency, translucency, uh, and open world. And, and Amazon Jungle is uh, pretty much uh, all uh, lush foliage, trees. And this is really difficult. This is very, very uh, challenging from technical standpoint and from performance standpoint. All right, so uh, let's get to the, uh, to the optimization. One of the first issues to start with when optimizing anything is to reduce geometry poly count. Uh, this is probably the biggest problem when porting a PC or console title to Quest. Uh, currently games, PC games or, or console games uh, throw millions of, of polygons on screen at once and uh, uh, is a safe bet uh, for Oculus Quest to keep poly count uh, budget under 100,000 uh, polys. So, uh, so everything over 100,000 polys on, on Oculus Quest would most likely prevent us from having 72 frames per second. So cutting poly count is, uh, is, is basically the, the first thing which, which has to be done, which we believe have, has to be done. Uh, when we use Unreal, it's a lot easier because there is a great load tool to, uh, to automatically cut the poly count. But for Unity, well, there is a bunch of external tools, uh, but we found that uh, unfortunately, the best way, the best quality uh, of, of loads is uh, uh, when you do it by hand. So this is a significant job to, uh, to redo all the art assets uh, to have the poly count down. So smart using of engine load system is a must. And, uh, and by smart, I mean that uh, it has to be fine tuned to find a, a goal, a sweet spot between quality and performance. Because uh, if we switch the loads too early or they are too simple, it's just visible. And, uh, and that, uh, that reduces the quality, the, the, the visual quality of the game. Uh, so it has to be fine tuned to find a uh, um, best way or best point where you can switch the lots. And uh, uh, fog helps a lot with that. So, so you can mask the, the switching points with fog and you can also uh, reduce the draw distance with, with fog. And this is something I talk about uh, uh, a little more later on. Lights. So lighting is another subject where there are lots to be gained in terms of improving performance. The basic rule is to use uh, pre-built static light everywhere if possible, like light maps and, and light props. Uh, of course, we need to keep the light map size uh, limited and the number of light props as low as possible 
since too much of those will also decrease performance significantly. Unfortunately, it's not always possible for, uh, for example, we couldn't use static lights in layers of fear because the environment was dynamically changing during the game. So as I said before, there, there, there were instances where uh, you enter the doors and there was a different room behind it. Also, the, the environment was changing during the game. So at first, that uh, the, the building was looking pretty normal, as regular house, and then it looked at, uh, looked like like a haunted house uh, with like you know strangely looking structures on on, on walls and uh, in the corridors and rooms. So also, uh, mm, per pixel dynamic lighting is, is killing performance, but still we couldn't uh, uh, do um, pre-rendered light maps because the, the, the whole levels were dynamic. So what we did is uh, we used vertex light instead, uh, which was the best way to, to keep performance high. And also we try to keep uh, the number of lights uh, as little as, as small as possible. And uh, we had at most three lights at once, but it's, it's a good idea to have not more than one light at, at the time. We also turned dynamic shadows off completely for layers of fear. So there was no, no shadows, no dynamic shadows at all. We, uh, all we did was, uh, uh, well, we basically had to, to get away without it. It was a little different for, for Blair Witch, where we have uh, starting light with light maps and light probes generated for the levels. And, uh, and there is one dynamic light from player's flashlight. Uh, we had to use that uh, the dynamic light because flashlight is uh, is like uh, the, the the core gameplay mechanics for the game. Basically, you are uh, lost in uh, in dark woods most of the time, and flashlight is the only light source you have. Uh, however, we also turned off uh, dynamic shadows, so so the uh, the flashlight didn't cast any shadows at all. Shaders is another subject where uh, a lot of optimization have to be done. Uh, as with everything, the rule of thumb is uh, the simpler is the better. So basically, uh, the shaders should be as basic as possible, as simple as possible, preferably only diffuse. So, so uh, if there is anything more than diffuse, it will hit performance. And what sometimes can be done is that some um, objects, some materials have something more than, than diffuse, like for example, normal mapping, but it's better to bake uh, uh, shadows uh, from normal maps or detail from normal maps into diffuse and use diffuse only. Of course, uh, physically based rendering uh, is, is completely, is almost completely forbidden. It doesn't, doesn't work. It will, uh, it will kill performance and we, uh, we are avoiding it uh, at all costs. The only thing uh, which is a little more advanced in, in terms of shaders which can be used is, uh, is uh, vertex shaders animator animations. So we can do uh, moving leaves and, uh, uh, and moving grass using that. And that actually does not uh, have big impact on, on performance. Um, also, one of the things which was heavily used in the original uh, Blair Witch game was post-processing. So there was uh, a bunch of special effects, full skin effects that uh, happened uh, frequently. There were uh, a lot of uh, uh, things like, uh, uh, like for example, uh, color grading. Uh, we cannot use any post-processing at all. Post-processing is, uh, is uh, totally killing performance and uh, it's almost impossible to, to reach 72 frames per second with any post-processing on. 
So instead of using post-processing for color grading, we, uh, we used fog instead. So fog helps, helped us to, uh, to create atmosphere with, uh, uh, with, with uh, having a color palette similar to how we do that with, uh, with color grading. Another thing that uh, is very um, has has a, a, a very negative impact on performance uh, is uh, is translucency. So creating things like water or transparent glass windows is a challenge, uh, since shaders with alpha channel should be seriously avoided at all costs. Transparent polygons create a, a big impact on frame rate especially when overlapping. So, so when we have, uh, like for example, foliage, and there is uh, uh, a lot of trees, one behind the other, another, uh, it will, uh, the, the, the performance will be dropping significantly because there are polygons of, uh, with translucency that overlap. So what can be done for uh, foliage is one bit mask, and this is good solution, uh, which uh, which is pretty good performance-wise. Uh, but still, we should uh, avoid having a lot of uh, polygons uh, one behind the other. Uh, when we need to do water or or glass uh, surfaces like windows. Um, we avoid uh, translucency and just make reflections instead. And uh, static reflex, uh, reflection probes can be used for that and they work pretty good. Draw calls is, uh, uh, this is another big subject. Uh, draw calls have, uh, uh, can slow down performance very, uh, very significantly. And uh, again, we should keep it simple. We should keep a uh, number of draw calls as low as possible. And uh, there's a number of things that can be done. Uh, firstly, setting stereo rendering method to single pass stereo. That cuts, uh, in most cases, the, the uh, uh, number of draw calls by half. And uh, secondly, we can uh, prepare materials for static and dynamic bunching of objects on levels when building the game. So uh, what happens is uh, when we bunch uh, models, that, uh, uh, that makes all the bunch models uh, that, that draws them in one pass. So this is, uh, this is very, very good for performance. What we also did so we, we even went as far as manually merging separate objects into one. For example, when we had trees, we, uh, we, we manually merged them into one object. Uh, the same was for, for example, books. So even a lot of different objects that uh, were in one room were merged in one object to, uh, to limit the number of draw calls. As far as materials go, uh, we should have as little materials and textures as possible so that the engine uh, can bunch uh, the models with the same materials together during building process. Uh, also creation of atlases instead of separate textures for grouped models is very helpful. When creating models, we should uh, use only one material when possible except models with transparent trees, Because what happens uh, when we want to have one material for all polygons on tree is that we'll have uh, uh, translucent material on trunk, which, uh, which is even worse than having two passes for the model. Another thing that is uh, very important and is directly connected with number of polygons on screen and uh, indirectly connected with a number of draw calls is the general view distance and what is visible and rendered on screen at any given moment. So uh, we want to keep the render distance as close as possible 
For example, you can see that on the on the screenshots I have, and on the left side there is a PC version, and on the right side the the Quest version. And uh, we masked it with fog, so it's not very visible. But the drawing distance is very short or very close on the Quest version. What also can be done is uh, is a lot of the detail that is uh, in the geometry on the PC version can be uh, drawn on the on the on the background uh, on the skybox basically. So so that helped with uh, keeping the uh, draw distance close and the number of polygons, the poly count, under hundred thousand uh, on screen at once. Other thing that was uh, pretty important for us when working on uh, on Blair Witch uh, is that we basically had to redesign uh, the levels from scratch to give them more corridor corridor like structure uh, with rocks surrounding the player's path. So it only looks like it's an open world woods, but uh, uh, in reality, the player is very limited uh, in where he can venture on the level. And uh, we've got a couple of examples here where uh, basically the path is limited from both sides by rocks, but it feels like it's, uh, it's uh, an uh, open woods. And uh, uh, the player does not have that feeling that he's uh, walking in the, in the narrow corridor. In fact, he is. So this is pretty much what we uh, what we did for both of those uh, projects. Uh, as always, it, it seems a lot easier to say than to do. Um, it needs some fine tuning to find the perfect balance between quality, the looks and performance. And uh, I'd like to invite you to play Blair Witch for yourself uh, to judge how well we did uh, uh, optimize the, the game. And let me know if you think that uh, we succeeded in delivering to Oculus Quest the experience of getting lost in, uh, in dense woods. Uh, I would also like to invite any of you uh, to ask questions or maybe you know, get in touch with us uh, if you need help with optimization. Um, and I would like to, um, to, to, to maybe give uh, uh, opportunity to, uh, to our developers in house to answer the questions. Are there any questions maybe? Yeah, there are several questions. Sure. Uh, anyone who would like to submit, please use the Q and A mm -hmm. button uh, to you uh, to submit your question. Thank you, Radomir. First of all, Thank it, you. Is, uh, it is a very nice overview of uh, what kind of different techniques that can be used for Quest porting co co to Quest. I I have uh, one uh, maybe small question, but it is key. Still, we are seeing games that should port to both Quest One and Quest Two because the the level of um, yeah, we can still keep the presentation. Okay, we can also ah, yeah. so, yeah, okay. <laughs> no problem, no problem. I mean, if there is a need, you can always refer to the slides. But yeah, this is much nicer like that. So um, we are still seeing that. I mean, probably the studio's uh, recommendation or uh, prefer preference is porting to both Quest One and Quest Two because there is still a significant base on Quest One. I know that there are some AAA titles only focusing on Quest 2 release, but I would like to understand, first of all, um, what is your experience? Because there's a there's a huge gap between Quest 1 and Quest 2 in terms of the processing power and some other details. So are you still applying the same uh, techniques and then downgrading your Quest 2 uh, releases or are you opening up some of the things for Quest 2 uh, people so they will enjoy more? Because we always see that Oculus is also liking to promote uh, enhanced for Quest 2 type of thing. So happy to hear more about that, how you are keeping the balance between Quest 1 and Quest 2 production. Well, in fact, uh, there is no such a, a huge gap or difference in terms of performance between Quest 1 and Quest 2. I believe Quest 2 is around maybe 20 to 30% faster, uh, but still it's, it's such a limited platform compared to, to a PC that the that, that, that 20% difference still 
uh, forces us to use all those techniques, mm -hmm. and uh, and we we, uh, we we apply all those techniques uh, to both quest one and quest two, and then we add a little more detail to quest two. Uh, quest two also have better uh, better resolution, uh, more memories, so we can use uh, higher resolution textures. But uh, our fundamentals are the same, and uh, and the same techniques has, has to be used. Also, uh, Facebook, as far as I know, uh, requires uh, all titles to support Quest One, and uh, and that's not gonna change anytime soon. So um, so it's a uh, it's a good idea to aim for Quest One and then improve Quest Two version a little bit. Mm -hmm. Great, great. So uh, yeah, let's open up the questions to the stage. There are already questions. Maybe um, I can also invite uh, some of our um, um, trainers, mentors, and our uh, maybe uh, alumni to ask questions. And we are also looking at the Q&A tab. There are already two questions there. So. Mm -hmm. um, First of all, Ruben, uh, maybe you can also uh, say uh, hi. Uh, he's, he's our trainer on rendering optimization. So do you have any question or any comment uh, about these games? And maybe you would like to introduce yourself a little bit. I will start with the first question. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, yeah. So. Thanks for the presentation. I think it was great. I really enjoyed uh, having a look at through your slides. Very simple, but uh, very well structured, all the bullet points. And I think everything was on point there. So I was happy to see that some of the techniques I also had to apply in the past also, you know, have a lot to do what, uh, with what you said in your slides. So there's a lot of common ground that uh, I'm happy to see, right? So yeah, so let me start by introducing myself. I'm Ruben. Uh, yeah. I am also known as the Game Dev Guru. The, the Game Dev Guru. Game Dev Guru. Sorry. And um, basically, I started probably a year and a half ago creating my blog, right? In which I wanted to, you know, my idea was to communicate um, to the world the opportunities that you have to improve the performance of your games, right? Right. In general, I mostly focused on Quest, but you know everything that also applies to Quest applies to mobile because it's a, basically a mobile platform. So, yeah, that's about it. Um, yeah, so performance is one of the topics that I've seen people struggle the most, especially when moving to mobile, right? And especially even more uh, worse, even worse, right? When people move from mobile to VR, that's uh, probably one of the most difficult things you can do in terms of performance. And because I've seen so many people struggle, me, my, myself, especially, like I spent months just getting something to, to, to perform at 72 FPS, right, on Quest. Uh, then I decided that I could share my knowledge with the rest of the world, right, and try to make people's lives a bit easier, so. Perfect, thank you. That's my main motivation. Yeah, thank you for the uh, intro. Uh, if there is any uh, question that you would like to comment on, please feel free to go ahead. I'm um, happy to answer the questions. So, yeah. like, for example, the let me uh, scroll a little bit. Yeah. Me uh, the first question is uh, why we used Unity uh, for Layers of Fear and why Unreal Engine for Blair Witch. The answer is very simple. Uh, the original game uh, was uh, Layers of Fear. The original game was in Unity and uh, Blair Witch Project was in Unreal. So instead of uh, uh, redoing the game from scratch in a different engine, we decided to, um, to optimize uh, the game within the engine that it origin originally, originally was made in. Uh, that's the answer. Uh, for Green Hell, we are actually using Unity because uh, we think it's uh, a little lighter. It it offers a little better performance uh, for VR, so it's easier to make a Unity game on VR in uh, good performance in 72, 72 frames per second than uh, the other game. Um, I hope that answers okay. uh, the question. Also, uh, 
I don't know what impostor is or impostor. Maybe maybe uh, Ayhan is here actually. Maybe he can he can directly ask the question in person. Okay. He's he's one of our uh, mentors for the advanced classes. So uh, hi Ayhan. So would you like Hello. to share a little bit about? You have actually one more question. Maybe you can go ahead and ask these two. Yeah, questions. I can't see my question right now because. <laughs> yeah. So one moment. of them is. Do you, did you think about using impostors to boost the performance? Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, I don't know, maybe maybe you've used it. Uh, I know that uh, titles like um, Fortnite uh, are using techniques like uh, impostors to boost performance. So it's more or less a, a technique to um, transfer a, a 3D model into a texture from a, a specific, oh, wow. from different perspectives. So you don't render the model itself, but uh, the textures. It would be interesting. Yeah, we are considering this for uh, Blair Witch uh, because there's, uh, there's a lot of trees and we were thinking that maybe uh, switching geometry to, uh, to a flat uh, texture at some distance would, uh, would help. It didn't because uh, uh, because there there were easier methods to do it, and also I believe uh, we would uh, run into issues with uh, uh, with lights. So it, it basically didn't yeah. light properly. So uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's the reason why we didn't use impostors. Okay, interesting. You had one more question, uh, yeah. Mayhan. Would you like to? Should I read? Yeah. Can you can you read it? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> can you talk a bit about your approval process into Oculus Store? Uh -huh. Are there some points you would say this is a must, and you have to take care of it when you want to approve by Oculus? This is actually an important thing that I also want to share with Ayhan and uh, with SideQuest and a few more um, stakeholders in the industry, we are creating an ultimate guide for publishing, promoting, and even monetizing on the um, App Lab, SideQuest, and uh, Oculus Store. So we are we created an FAQ actually collected from different developers' questions. So whatever you can give as an advice to be approved as a store in store, I think this will be great because you are one of the few lucky ones uh, still as a studio that is approved. So um, and there are many people who are aiming for that. So uh, your your advice will be appreciated, Radamir. Yeah, in fact, uh, it's uh, very difficult to get unpro uh, approved to the store, the Oculus store. Um, it's... Uh, it's uh, firstly the, the certification process itself is very difficult, but to get uh, uh, approval by uh, by Facebook by Oculus to the store, uh, what you need to have is the, the original idea, something that uh, works well in VR. And by original idea, I mean um, it has to be a unique uh, uh, VR experience. It has to have uh, unique VR uh, mechanics, especially in terms of controls, uh, doing basically a, a simple one-to-one -one PC port to VR just does not work. Like, like just placing, because a lot of people think that, uh, think that it's, it's very easy to, to make a VR port because it's just uh, 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 you know, uh, dumping a, a VR uh, camera inside the game. It's not like that. I'm, the, the, the biggest issue uh, after performance is um, finding unique experience something that is uh, only possible in vr and that adds a lot in vr so if we have two games one is on pc and the other is on vr the vr version has to have something uniquely vr-ish i would say so something like like uh, like that vr feel that we are inside and all the mechanics all the interactions have to be read though with that philosophy in mind and uh, that has to be uh, Oculus needs to be convinced that firstly we know how to technically make a game on Oculus Quest for Oculus Quest because all of those issues I was talking about before and secondly that we understand what makes a VR game great mm -hmm. and uh, and it, uh, it it's difficult it, it needs a lot of thought a lot of development uh, a lot of design 
uh, and then that uh, has to be proposed to to Oculus, and uh, and only after they uh, believe that uh, firstly uh, we can do a, an Oculus Quest game, and secondly that uh, we know what's great in VR, then they are confident enough to allow us uh, into the Oculus Store. Uh, and also what's, uh, I think, pretty important at this point is that, uh, as far as I know, Oculus right now is focused on, uh, on Quest. This is their major primary platform. And uh, if we want to, uh, to have something published uh, in VR, we should, uh, we should consider Quest the, the, the leading platform, the major platform. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe if it is not so much uh, like um, because we are in a, a public, I mean, we are in a public event uh, that might be a little bit uh, for you uh, difficult to answer every question, but you usually commence with a vertical slice uh, or first you are showing the game design document. So uh, how much you have to finish to start pitching to Quest? Maybe I can ask this kind of question. So what is the bare minimum in terms of production um, readiness to start pitching? Well, Not even is... acceptance, like pitching. Okay, so if there is no uh, prior experience, uh, if we didn't uh, uh, release anything before on Oculus Quest and, uh, and if, uh, Oculus uh, basically cannot uh, look at us as uh, uh, experienced developers who know what they are doing, then uh, I think vertical slice or some kind of prototype working on Oculus Quest is a must. So mm -hmm. what I would do is uh, I would prepare uh, a good pitch, a good uh, uh, high concept of the game and uh, a vertical slice or some kind of prototype or proof of concept that is playable on Oculus Quest. Okay, okay. Um, maybe is there anything like having a success in SteamVR on all other platforms can also work or they are only looking at Oculus success, Oculus store success? It really depends because uh, Oculus is very reluctant in uh, um, supporting Oculus Quest titles, which were already released on, on other uh, VR platforms. Okay. So yeah. having a VR game on, on Steam VR actually may be counterproductive. It actually may, uh, may be worse than, than it, it may not help at all. Okay, so the App Lab is the only way. Of course, like for StreamYard, you are having the opportunity to have a tethered experience, but App Lab is the, or SideQuest is the only way maybe because we are seeing a few successful titles on uh, SideQuest becoming a store product whenever they prove themselves there. So I think this path is much better than Steam VR path, I guess. Totally, totally. I, I'd, I'd say that this is a way better uh, way to go than to release something on Steam VR first. Okay, that's that's very interesting, good to know. Um, so let's continue because uh, questions are piling up. Mm -hmm. So the, the next question is virtual rendezvous. What about limiting movement speed? Is that also important? Well, so uh, other thing that is very important in general on, uh, on VR platform uh, is, uh, is having comfortable experience. And uh, this depends on a lot of uh, uh, different things. Like it, it, one of the things is actually movement speed. And uh, uh, too fast movement will most likely increase the possibility of, uh, of uh, getting sick for a lot of people. Yeah. So that needs to be, that needs to be uh, kept down if possible. Also, uh, there are ways to, uh, to increase the, uh, the comfort with, uh, um, um. yeah, with, with tunneling, with uh, uh, having uh, fixed, um, fix the degree rotation. Uh, yeah, but but having the, the uh, slower movement speed is uh, is one of the things that uh, that's recommended. Mm -hmm. And maybe I can also ask a follow up question here. Um, our previous open lecture was uh, about locomotion, 
we actually uh, show a lot of different types of locomotion or teleportation for those for others so what is your uh, perspective on this like uh, how because your games some of them are really like movement is very critical right and you are maybe even like almost some of them will be open world we don't know of course green hell how, how will it look like your next game but uh, how you are what is the best solution for you out there or you are using or do you have it maybe proprietary technique uh, for locomotion or movement in your vr games uh, well it, it's very personal thing like like some people prefer uh, teleporting some prefer free movement uh, we use both for our projects. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, we, we didn't have teleport in uh, Layers of Fear, but uh, in Blair Witch and uh, in Green Hell, we will, uh, we will have both of those techniques. Mm. It's, it's a long story. I mean, it, uh, we can talk forever about how to make... Uh, it's, it's like such a huge subject that... Uh, yeah. that uh, uh, we can we can have another open lecture just for Definitely. that. I mean, last time I remember we talked two hours and yeah. it didn't finish. We continue in the after party and then clubhouse event uh, one day later. Yeah, it's huge. Like um, uh, there is a locomotion vote, by the way, for those who are really looking for different techniques. Uh, Mar Gonzalez from Microsoft Research, uh, she created it uh, over 100 techniques there. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you, Radomir. This is a very big subject, but of course important. But is there any, are you seeing like the locomotion technique is affecting the uh, optimization performance uh, because you have to a little bit move fast. So uh, based on virtual renderers um, question, like well, is it so much like, are you limiting just for the sake of uh, performance? No, I mean uh, performance uh, uh, has uh, impact on uh, on uh, uh, locomotion sickness. Uh, meaning, if you've got bad performance and and uh, uh, like not much uh, frames per second, something below fifty, then it will uh, increase sickness. But uh, this is well known, and and this is why uh, Oculus Quest uh, uh, required uh, requires uh, 72 frames per second most of the time in the game. Uh, but the other way around, I don't think it works the other way around this way. That uh, that if you've got faster moving, then it uh, has negative impact on performance. I don't think that uh, that's the case. I think uh, well, it might be. It may be if uh, if you need to. Uh, load uh, other parts of the level, but generally uh, we avoid the uh, uh, sickness by not letting players to move too fast. Okay. What is also pretty important is that we don't take controls from camera from the player, like never. We we don't do that because, uh, uh, like for example, if there are uh, if there are. Um, cinematic scenes, something like that, something you would do as a cinematic on PC, on a, on, on a console. Uh, when you take uh, uh, controls of the camera from the player and show him different parts of the, of the level or, or different direction in the level, that is, uh, uh, that is really bad in, uh, in VR. If you force the player's camera to rotate when he is not moving his head, that will uh, make him sick like right away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ruben, do you have any comment on your perspective, how you usually handle movement for the sake of optimization? Well, uh, the only thing I was thinking of is, you know, it depends what happens when you move. If you load levels or load assets in the background, then yes, it will have indeed a performance impact on that. But it is usually not so much about performance, but like uh, Radomir said, more about the VR experience, right? And also just bear in mind that whenever you get, you know, very far away in, uh, from the center or the origin of the world space, you start having some issues, right? For example, physics suddenly start becoming uh, less accurate. Also rendering, you're, more, you're most likely to see glitches, like set fighting and these kind of things. So. In general, you know, uh, this could also be another challenge if you have big worlds that so you have to be very careful about the coordinate system. 
Mm-hmm. But not so much about performance, uh, in my experience, at least. Okay, one more follow-up again regarding this first person or third person, or are you open to any kind of third person experience in the future, Radomir? Uh, we are thinking about that, and uh, and uh, uh, I've played a bunch of third person games, like for example, Drover, which I really enjoyed and and uh, and like. But uh, no, what uh, what we are focused on right now is uh, is first person experience. Okay, okay. And um, our other uh, trainers, Dennis and Roger, they have a game called Holoception. They are using a hybrid system whenever you are actually um, acting or having an action, it's immediately zoom into your first person. They uh, create a seamless uh, transition between. Yeah, this is something that can also be uh, used in if, if relevant, of course, not every game is uh, uh, meaningful on that. So um, thank you for this question. So I will quickly uh, read the next one. What about the VFX and particle effects to Oculus? How did you create glitch effects for LOF? Like I said, uh, we, we basically... I got the... In terms of like particle effects, uh, we, we removed most of them or greatly reduced their number. Uh, uh, particle effects, like in, in themselves, are not a problem, but uh, they usually mean you use a lot of overlapping transparency, and that is a problem. So, so we need to really cut cut down on them and then only leave them uh, when when necessary or when they are not many of them and they occupy uh, not a, not a lot of the screen. Uh, so, so in layers of fear, we we. Um, only left them in, in a few parts when there are like I think candles use particle effects and, and a few, few few things like that. Um, in terms of like glitch effects, I'm not sure what what's meant by that, but uh, if it means like the hallucinations that that uh, the character is getting, that was all uh, originally uh, based on on post processing effects, and unfortunately we couldn't afford that at all in our quest port, so so we we had to get rid of them. Uh, pretty, okay. much, pretty much all of them. So we we don't see so much um, game currently in the store with, with these effects. There is no no company who attempt to do that. Have you seen any good implementation or examples in terms of the effects that you you see that uh, it's difficult to use? Any other game? Like full screen post processing? No, I don't. I don't think post processing is possible at all. Yeah, I, I mean, it is possible, but you immediately lose half the frame rate. So, so yeah. if anyone is actually using that, they, they have to have a very, very streamlined, limited experience uh, in terms of what they can display. Maybe then they can get away with it. But uh, last last time I looked at at the the, um, the best looking experiences, none of them use that. Uh, but of course, the, the situation is changing all the time. So maybe now someone, someone, especially on Quest Two, maybe someone came yeah. up with a method to, to do that convincingly and 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 within performance. But I I can't think of an example of off the top of my head. Okay, Ihan, do you have anything yeah. to say? Maybe one follow-up question. Uh, it's a bit more technical, maybe uh, regarding your uh, current game you are working on. Um, Greenhouse. That you are using uh, Unity as well. Uh, are you using things like compute buffers or um, the new uh, t- uh, data-oriented technologies like so dots in Unity to optimize things, or uh, are you more uh, sticking to more conventional uh, optimization uh, techniques? Uh, honestly, I I don't know uh, the answer to that question. I am actually I am not on the, the project you're asking about, so so I, I cannot uh, answer. Okay. We should ask to the architect. <laughs> we can we can check that and and get back. Yeah, to it would be it would be interesting to know uh, okay. because compute buffers are not always used, but in some cases they can boost performance. So it would be interesting if uh, if and why you are using it maybe because compute buffers again use uh, the the GPU and as far as I hear uh, until now. The, the games were uh, GPU bound, uh, so 
he had, I think, less problems with the CPU than with the GPU, right? If I understood the correct answer. What are the, what is the biggest load coming to CPU or GPU on your side? Uh, so the graphics, I think, then. It's it's really, it's, it's both. <laughs> I mean, both? <laughs> okay. You, you really have to tune everything down because okay. usually it's graphics, usually it's graphics, but we we oftentimes there are spots where we could shed uh, like whole milliseconds uh, by optimizing uh, scripts. So so okay. uh, it really it really depends on the scene. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, one thing I would like to add is that um, you can also use uh, GPU skinning. I think they are made in compute buffers. So you, as a programmer, don't do anything with compute buffers. But if you tick that checkbox in Unity then uh, UT does skinning on the GPU. So, and that helps a lot uh, of loading some work from the CPU. So mm -hmm. it always depends on your scenario, of course, if you are more CPU or GPU bound, but in my case, it was always worth to, to you know, to try it out, the GPU skinning part. Yeah, yeah we, we definitely had GPU skinning on in, uh, in layers of fear, yep. Perfect. Um, Ruben, uh, one one thing that I would like to ask regarding specifically for VFX part, uh, as far as I remember, we have uh, either in the nightmare scenario or on the uh, modules. Do we have something about directly with VFX particle VFX? Um, can you explain a little bit uh, what what kind of technique or uh, what we are teaching there in the class very quickly? Well, the technique for for uh, particle effects is usually keep them small in the screen space. <laughs> I'm afraid that's the answer, right? Keep them small, like in screen space, in pixels, and don't layer them on top of each other, right? So that's basically it. But of course, if you make them small and then you still make the, you let the player get close to it, right? And look at it like this, then it's going to be a kind of a post-processing effect after all, and then your frame rate can suddenly drop to 30 FPS. So you have to be very careful with post-processing effects. And yeah. in that scene, uh, yes, there is some um, post-processing, sorry, some um, particle effects there. But, you know, you can also do some tricks, like try to use more additive shaders than alpha blender. They're also cheaper on the GPU. Yeah. But yeah, any... we, we are still on mobile, so. Yeah. Is there any anything you add as a spice to particle effect to the nightmare scenario that the uh, people will have to somehow reduce? Yes, yes, there will be a, a part of that uh, okay. I, because it's part of most games, right? If you're putting yeah, something, definitely. you need to know how to handle particle effects. Definitely. So uh, one more question from Amber. Um, is it easier to get it running smooth in Unreal or Unity? Maybe I can also add one more question. Like when you look at the uh, optimization pipeline and the number of hours you spent, you prefer an Unreal build to optimize or you prefer an Unity build to optimize? The same scenario, the same game, uh, uh, just which ones is developer friendly and take less time? Well, I think, um, well, it, it's a personal preference pretty much. And, and it very much depends on what you have most experience with, but but most of us here, I think would agree that Unity uh, is, uh, is a better choice. Like if we could choose, if we are optimizing a game for, for the quest, on Unreal or in Unity, then we would choose the Unity uh, because it's just, it gives you more control over rendering. It gives you more control all, over shaders uh, than, than Unreal does. And um, uh, that's, that, that, that uh, cuts, really, really cuts uh, uh, down the time that, that's needed to optimize. Uh, and it, Actually, it gives you more more opportunities to to really get into the details of how things are drawn and and um, to to squeeze out like the, the last bits of performance. In in Unreal, it's it's really it like renders uh, in a way that's predefined and there is not much you can do, and uh, there are just some things you you cannot optimize because Unreal doesn't give you the option to do that. Of course, you have access to the source code and you can like rewrite the engine uh, the rendering pipeline if you want to from scratch, but that takes months. And, and you know, uh, you can uh, achieve the same, the same uh, results in Unity in a matter of days, uh, often, often, not always, of course. Okay. 
Okay, that's also then you are also saying that it is from a, for example, intermediate developer, it's also better to use Unity uh, when they are on the optimization process. Uh, because you don't need to so much go deep dive into the coding side compared to Unreal source code manipulation. Am I correct? Or like in terms of the easiness in uh, like, do you need to know so much coding skills, at least like compare when you come, of course you need to know, but com when you compare Unreal and Unity, which ones that you need a really advanced developer to go deep in the... Uh, yeah, yeah. Like in, in Unity, uh, like to, to do good optimization, you need to most importantly know not only how to code, but, but uh, you need to know how shaders work, how the rendering pipeline works, and how you, you and uh, how Unity exposes those things to 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 let you let you uh, control it uh, in in some in some way. If you want uh, the, the same degree of control in Unreal, you really need to dive into the C++ source code, and that's a that's a much bigger hurdle, uh, especially if you're starting out uh, in my opinion. Okay, thank you for this question. So I will continue very quickly with the next one. Can what I add something very quickly? Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I think having the source code in the case of Unreal Engine can be a blessing, but also a curse, right? Because yeah. it happened yeah. to me in the past that I was just trying to optimize some game in Unity, right? And uh, I just ran the profiler and sometimes I just saw markers that were not self-explanatory, right? So let's say I see one millisecond spent on X and then you Google and there is nothing about it. <laughs> so sometimes having access to the source code will be helpful. But on the other side, I know that you can then start to spend months and months right, in trying to rewrite something. So it's yeah. a kind of a, a struggle sometimes. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. So Casper is asking, what is the first aspect you look at when you are porting an already finished game into VR? I assume he, Casper means uh, finished PC game. So, um, so well, maybe how you decide, right? How you decide which game to port? Because maybe there are some game, I know, like for example, there are real time, we are not seeing so much real time strategy games, right? In uh, VR quest. So um, do you have any criteria before deciding decision process to port to VR? Well, obviously, it has to make sense in VR. Not everything does make sense in VR. Uh, like, you know, the player, when uh, he has a choice of playing the same game in VR and on uh, in, in flat version, then he will be playing flat version unless the VR version is significantly better in a way because of the VR experience. So as you said, some strategy games would probably not, uh, strategical games would not make sense in, in VR, in my opinion. And uh, and that would be one of the first things you would uh, uh, think about when, when porting a game. The second thing is probably what engine is it, uh, is it made in, because uh, if it's Unity, it's great. It's Unreal. If it's Unreal, that's uh, that's fine too. But uh, if it's some kind of engine which has no VR support yet at all, then we would uh, probably uh, be very reluctant to to try to uh, to implement that VR support also in terms mm -hmm. of you know like rendering and all that. Mm -hmm. those things. Okay, great. So um, one another question. Uh, how strict is the 72 frames per second requirement? I ask because in the game I'm building, uh, I usually average around 71 to 71.5 frames per second on a Quest 1. Would that be acceptable for the Oculus Store? Uh, Lisa is asking. Well, yeah, I think it would uh, if there is no frequent drops, like, like they, they pretty much want 72 frames per second. It's uh, it's uh, it's uh, kind of strict requirement, but uh, drops not frequent and very short drops are allowed. So if it drops from time to time to let's say 65 or 60 even, but it's just a split of the second, uh, I mean just a couple a couple of frames dropped, then it's fine too. 
Uh, I'm not sure if 71 most of the time. Well, uh, what's important is that it's not to look so much at the average FPS. Uh, it's not really what they look at. What they look at is how how often drops happen. So so if you have like Radomir said, you have 72, 90 percent of the time, and then you have drops every few seconds. Uh, a few frames are dropped. That's that's fine. But if you have like 71 the whole time, then that's that's a problem. Okay. The way that you can uh, have a look at this is by using a tool that's called OVR metrics. It, can display, it displays you the performance of your game in a graph. So you normally it should be all green, green right? L uh, like a line from side to side. And if it's not, then you will see something like this dropping, right? So I wouldn't risk it. I would personally always try to be straight, a straight line at 72. But yeah. Use of VR metrics, I think that's a good tool for this. Maybe uh, if you can uh, write on the chat window, it will be great. We can also share on the Discord channel. So, um, yes, great. So yeah. Quick follow up. There is, a, there is a tool, maybe you know it already. It's called Oculus Developer Hub. So uh, it's easy with this tool to install the OVR metrics inside your quest. Previously, you had to do it uh, with cable and with a batch tool, but now with the Oculus Develop app, you just click a button and it installs it directly to your quest. And then you can use it, like Ruben said, inside your quest to, to see all kinds of metrics. You can al also uh, turn on and turn off some metrics you don't need. So it's very, very uh, useful and recommended. Yeah, uh, we can also, yeah, we also take this. Perfect. So um, one also in, important question for me always, like sometimes some AAA games, even uh, the QA testing, beta testing period is, or even polishing period is taking as much as time uh, than the production period. So let's talk a little bit uh, before finishing. Let's talk a little bit about the QA part. Of course, you are getting a lot of feedback. You are doing user tests. How does it work on your case? What is your best, um, like in addition to your own, uh, of course, testing environment, what is the um, your QA process going on? How, how long does it take? How much it is important to create and maybe standardization on the QA process for Oculus? So happy to hear more about the QA part and polishing part. Uh, well, the Oculus certification process is uh, is pretty strict and, and pretty difficult, uh, uh, especially the Quest, the, the Oculus Quest one, uh, and uh, and they need uh, uh, the build which is um, pretty polished already to to start the certification process. So it's very important to have uh, an internal beta testing team. Uh, that can uh, that can verify and, and find all, all the bugs and help the team to uh, to polish the game and uh, and have the, the, the tested and, and uh, well working build to start the certification process. Um, from our experience, uh, it takes between at least two months. I would uh, I'd say to pass the certification process uh, from Oculus for uh, for Oculus Quest. And uh, and and they are pretty good at finding all the bugs. So uh, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> so don't try to hide it. They're fine. Are they charging you for this QA testing process? <laughs> I don't think they do. Uh, I'm not sure, but I, I I don't remember at this point. I I don't know, but uh, I don't think they do charge for it. But uh, but it's very strict and it's uh, it's very thorough and. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, you really need to have a, a well-tested build before you start it. So, so uh, in-house beta testing team, I believe, is a must. Okay, okay. Um, by the way, uh, as a as a company, are you giving this kind of service for those who are preparing for uh, like quest publishing? Are you supporting some studios, or how is your approach there? <laughs> We don't do that at this point. I mean, we don't have any, any customers uh, who we help with uh, in terms of quality assurance, but uh, 
uh, we are always happy to help and uh, we are always looking for new business. So if there are needs like that, I'm sure we can help. Okay, great. Great. So um, I will continue very quickly. But uh, in the meantime, is there anyone in this uh, stage who would like to take uh, maybe a quest, uh, have a question? Uh, Diego or anyone else here? Here, any questions? Please go ahead. Otherwise, sure. I'm... I love to. Hi, hi Diego. So uh, Diego is uh, our alumni. You are still in Canada, I guess. Yep, yep. I'm still in Canada. Thank you. Very yeah. happy here. Um, I mean, this talk is super, super relevant to us because we very recently just published our game in Steam and we're in the process of optimizing it for Oculus Quest. Um, so we're, we're wondering mainly about the draw calls, like how many should we target for Quest? Um, how can we like decrease them? Because we have <laughs> lots and lots of objects that are the same object in a way, right? So some guidance there would be really, really useful. Okay, this one. Yeah, we're, uh, did I? Like I can yeah. some, shed some light. I don't. Uh, I can't really quote the numbers off the top of my head. Like what was our the, the top limit for for the number of draw calls? It was like probably somewhere around two hundred or one fifty or something like that. And well, uh, obviously I, 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 that's that's one of the top things that you need to reduce, and and there are ways of reducing it and. Uh, we did like a, um, we used a variety of approaches uh, there uh, from from like the automated batching in Unity that that works very well. But you need to set up the object so that the batching actually happens, and then you need to on the build you need to verify if it actually happened because you, you might set think okay these these are you know. Uh, uh, you have several objects, and, and they will they use the same materials, and and they are close to each other. They should batch, and then you run the build, and it turns out that for Unity, for some reason, uh, it doesn't batch them or batches them in a way that you didn't expect. So so that there's a lot of um, trial and error there. Uh, so sometimes we we just combine the meshes ourselves manually. It's of course labor intensive, but but at least you know uh, you have full control over over what's happening and. And and uh, so yeah, we use that as well. There's also dynamic batching in Unity, but it's very limited in, in the amount of um, uh, geometry that can be batched that way uh, in runtime. I think so. So uh, we didn't really rely on that. Um, uh, we also use GPU instancing in some cases. Uh, it can help you reduce draw calls greatly, uh, but it's a very like. Uh, um, uh, it only works in, in a very few cases when you have like the same, not only the same materials, but also the same, the same geometry for the objects you're trying to draw. And also they need to be affected by the same, same number of dynamic lines. Uh, so, uh, so you can gain a lot there. You can like draw hundreds of objects in one draw call, but uh, there are very strict limits into what, what the object can look like. So yeah, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of stuff that, that can be done uh, to, to keep those draw calls down. Also, the, uh, um, the, of course, there's like distance cooling and stuff like that that, that uh, removes objects from, from being drawn. Uh, that's like one of the obvious things. But sometimes we, we went down and removed objects manually because we knew they wouldn't be seen by the player because they're, they are like behind the door or behind the wall that you can no, no longer go to or something like that and uh, there are objects that wouldn't be cooled normally but we we just used like trigger volumes and stuff like that so we know okay if the player went here then he will no longer see the objects behind that wall or something so we manually hit them uh, in, in a couple of instances to just gain a couple of more extra draw calls saved uh, in that scene that that give, gives us the the required 72, 72 fps and uh, a lot of a lot of approaches, and you need to use all of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, wonderful. Um, how about like um, shaders when it comes to Fresnel effects, for example? Because we completely got rid of all the lights, but to give objects some shine, we're actually using a Fresnel effect. And given that that's being calculated based on the build direction, then um, I'm wondering if that could have some performance effects. Uh, I'm not sure I understood the question. Uh... So uh, Fresnel effect is basically a glow that's on the outside. That's calculated with the dot product of the geometry and the view. 
uh, it basically has a ring lighting in a way. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if that could also be a performance uh, intensive, given that that's calculated based on where the user is looking at. Like if I'm watching a mesh from this direction, the shine is on the oven. But if I'm regional, this regional direction. rendering, regional rendering, right? You are talking about regional. Landing. It's a shader, basically. Yeah. Uh, in terms of shaders, uh, you want to keep them simple. And uh, yeah, we, we had like yeah. diffuse on almost everything. Yeah, like, except for some like select few objects that are, are very rare. If you if you rely, rely on on uh, complicated shaders, uh, those will most likely not work fast enough on uh, on Opus. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, Thank you. By the way, uh, please share your uh, games link on chat maybe if yep. anyone Absolutely. wants to do free qa testing <laughs> yeah i mean um, got it early access absolutely right? absolutely yeah it's in early access um okay. we're pushing some updates very very soon uh, but yeah we're Perfect. very excited by the way for those i see that uh, lisa also um virtual um virtual rendezvous is also having some projects so please feel free to share that on discord our discord chan uh, server uh, there are many uh, people, enthusiastic people who wants to give feedback or try, so uh, you can always utilize the Discord server. So I have last two questions um, and then we can wrap it up. So uh, one question from Tor um, is, in your Unity projects, any thoughts on choice between built-in pipeline versus URP? URP is dużo szybsze od Lustre. Jak używamy, teraz go używamy, jest super szybki. Yeah, so, so we, in, in, the, in layers of fear, we use the built-in pipeline and, and just, just went with that because URP was, I think, uh, not, not well developed or understood by, back then. Uh, or on our newest project, I'm not on it, like I said, but I think we're using URP uh, and uh, to, to, like, to great success. Okay, great. Okay, so we have last question from Julian. Do you think today's PC performance could happen on a mobile platform in 10 years time or will it never happen? So are, are we meaning that today's like 3090 GTX cards uh, performance or are we meaning that uh, the mobile platform will catch up PC performance? I don't know, uh, you can answer in terms of both. So um, what is it's a bit of a, like a like a futurology question and, and not really. Uh... Yeah, but I believe uh, I believe that uh, mobile platforms uh, uh, will definitely uh, be as fast as uh, as today's fastest uh, uh, PCs. In I, I, I don't actually. You don't. I think yeah. I think there are physical limits into the amount okay. of calculations uh, you can uh, do on uh, in, in a given that? power limit you have. In, yeah. okay. What's your opinion on the new Apple? Uh, the ARM processors. Uh, yeah, e. uh, which I was kind of like mobile architecture and you've got a uh, you know, new MacBook Air, which is almost as fast as i7 or even i9. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, but yeah, so. Yeah, but they switch, but, they switch architectures, right, to ARM. We yes. like on Quest. We are already using the ARM architecture, so we but cannot that, really improve. No, <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm saying. That that uh, that the, the new Apple uh, processors, I believe M1. That's what they M1, call. Yeah. Uh, they are mobile architecture, and they are pretty fast. Yeah. Still, so, 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 but yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's that's uh, that's. Uh, that's I mean, showing that there are still there are still uh, a lot of things that can be done to improve and. Uh, and there will be a lot of improvement, but I don't think we'll be able to get the amount of like raw processing power that we have in, in like the top end PCs now uh, on mobile. Uh, I don't think it's like physically possible. What's going to happen, in my opinion, is that we're going to get more clever ways to optimize things. Uh, so we better use um, the, the processing power that we, we have. Whether it's, whether it's going to be like cloud computing or offloading the, the processing somewhere else, yeah. or maybe it's going to be like optimizing what we, that we actually draw what we need. So maybe uh, foveated rendering combined with eye tracking that will let yeah. us uh, only draw the actual things that, that the eye sees and not like 90% of other stuff that, uh, that it cannot see in this microsecond. So, so I think there are a lot of, a lot of things that will be 
done in, in terms of, of these kinds of optimizations that will allow us to have on mobile platforms the quality that we see on the on PCs right now, but not, not necessarily through, through raw processing power that, that would match it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I also agree. This cloud trending would be really interesting. Ruben, would you like to add something? Your opinion? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's impossible to tell, but what I think is that in PC, in general, people don't spend that much time optimizing, right? They just release a game. If it doesn't perform, they tell you to upgrade your hardware, right? That's yeah. not so easily possible in VR. If it doesn't perform, it's the developer's fault and you don't really have much more you know, hardware to upgrade to. So there is also you know, uh, supply demand, I would say. There is just less uh, hardware uh, available for VR, uh, for standalone VR than for PC. So. And also, you know, uh, we also have uh, ray tracing enabled GPUs in, on desktop right now. Yeah. Uh, they're far from being perfect, but I honestly don't think we will ever be able to have uh, ray tracing in mobile, at least not in the coming years. That's super power intensive. And uh, this is one of the things that you should avoid, right, in uh, mobile hardware, which is to consume power. It is both bad for the battery and your playtime, and also bad for your face, I assume. You know, you, you don't want to burn your face just because it's consuming 10 watts of power or something like that. So you yeah, have to be very careful with power. Definitely, definitely. Okay, great. I mean, thank you for your uh, feedback on that. Um, I think this is a very nice last question to look at a little bit to the future. Uh, so we will, we will need optimization for quite a while, I guess in the next upcoming years, especially if we are really pushing for standalone. So um, any last questions or comment, anything else before closing? Radomir, would you like to say anything about your uh, like, um, like future projects or your vision towards uh, next projects or what kind of uh, game studios you are looking forward to work with? Happy to hear maybe if you have a few uh, closing words. Uh, yeah, so uh, I can't really disclose much information about uh, what we plan in the near future, uh, but uh, we are always on the lookout for uh, great, highly successful games to, to port them to, to Oculus Quest or, or other VR platforms. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, as much as I can say at this point. Okay. Uh, we are also always open to help other developers or uh, publishers to uh, to bring their titles to Oculus Quest or PSVR, for example. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I, I would like to really thank uh, thank uh, for the for the opportunity to talk uh, to you guys today. It was great. I really enjoyed it. I'm happy that uh, Peter and uh, Tomasz was with me today and could help me with uh, some very interesting and difficult technical questions. Uh, and again, thank you very much. And feel free to uh, to join me, uh, join, uh, connect me on LinkedIn, uh, drop me uh, a line or, or find me, call me. Uh, there was uh, there was my contacts uh, uh, if. Uh, I guess uh, Perkan can uh, can send. Yeah, yeah. The, we will we will share the uh, recording of this lecture so anyone can look at from the YouTube and see the slide that you shared the contacts mm -hmm. and uh, anyone who wants to reach we are also happy to share uh, on Discord you can find me as well. Thank you, Radomir. Thank you, Inkwati, Thank you much. for for uh, sharing your experience with us. It was quite actually helpful for anyone who wants to pu publish for Quest or even optimize their uh, game. So thank you, our trainers and our alumni here joining us. And the, of course, the audience who has been with us for the last one and a half hour. So thanks for this uh, today's lecture, open lecture, and happy to see you in the next one. And uh, have a very nice day with lots of VR and AR development. Bye. 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 Ciao.